Hey, Kelly Jarrell, world famous background singer for James Brown. You hit the high notes, you hit the, well, he hit the low ones. Welcome to my show, Let's Talk Concerts. I'm so excited to have you here today. Tell me, how are you? I'm really well. I'm really glad to be here with you, Peter. So thanks. It'll be fun. This is awesome. Now, now tell me where you got started. Uh, actually, I grew up in children's theater. I grew up in regional theater and, you know, community theater. So that's how I got my start. I got my singing start in school. You know, my mother kind of was a single mom raising three kids in the 70s. So I got uh, my like learning how to sight read and stuff like that from high school and and school. So stay in school and take chorus and, and band. But, um, so that that's kind of where I got that. And then, you know, I'm from Augusta, Georgia. I actually just moved back here you and a year and a half ago. I love I love Augusta. It's a great place to be from. And James Brown was here, and so uh, he heard me singing around town, and kind of, I, kind of, hounded him until he let me sing with him. Well, <laughs> the first thing I'll tell you is that uh, in the '80s, it had to be like '87, '88. We uh, did a gig in Augusta, Georgia, at whatever the local rock club was, and it was the week that James Brown got arrested for beating his wife. <laughs> It was that week, and we we're we we're taking pictures standing in front of the James Brown tour bus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see, I lived in Los Angeles when all of that, when he was put in jail, I was living in L.A., yeah. and everywhere I saw free James Brown stickers. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, if, if people knew, because being from here, that was old, you know, he was always up to a lot of those kind of shenanigans. Oh, yeah, so yeah. back up for a click and tell me, Tell me, when was the first time that you got on stage and performed? Oh, really little. I mean, seriously, my sisters and I were reciting Puck's speech from A Midsummer Night's Dream in Monroe, Georgia. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean it. So I, I've been, I was always on stage. My mother had a, a local television show here in Augusta. Um, and then what was she, it called? It was called it. Shoot, um, it was midday with June, and then uh, Carousel. So this was in nineteen. I'm sorry. This was in um, the mid seventies. Uh, all actually from seventy two to through the eighties is when my mom had a television show on WRDW Channel Twelve in Augusta, Georgia. That is so, awesome. and, and and she had a children's theater. She and her best friend had a children's theater and I was in theater and then and her and the uh, Jackie Christian was my mother's uh co-patriot that had the Augusta Children's Theater. Her daughter, Amy Christian, ended up singing with James Brown too. So here we go. Okay. So you're in Augusta and you're you're doing the local thing with the local bands and I'm assuming that you're playing local nightclubs. No, I really never did that. Um, what, with, with yeah, when I was really young, you know, we sang in a couple. My, me and my sisters, because we all we acoustic, you know, mm -hmm. we all sing together. So I did that around town just for a minute. And um, I, right out of high school, I got in with a band called Looker, and our agent was out of North Carolina. So on the weekends, we just kind of run up and down the East Coast. Mostly, you know, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, that kind of thing, just up and down. And let me yeah. let me stop you right there. So what year were you singing for Looker? Oh, so that was going on in the, that was 1979, 80, 81, around there. 1979 to 80, yeah. And how many people were in the group? Six. Six. So it was, and, and were you the lead vocalist? I was, I did, I so co-lead vocalist and then background stuff. But yeah, I was one of the, I was the female lead vocalist. Female lead vocalist. Was there a male and a female lead vocalist? Yeah. So it's yeah. A, it was a four-piece band with two singers. Um, yeah, 
two, three, four, but with the with the keyboard. So I guess like five with the. So you're a seven piece band. Okay. This band gets so bigger by the minute. Oh, dude, I remember. <laughs> we're, we're, it's okay. We're gonna dig through it. Okay. We're gonna dig through it. So you had a five piece band that you got to stand in front of and knock out the hits. Yeah. Now I'm assuming that you played more than one club. You guys must have been pretty good. Yeah. Then that's but yeah. It that's so yeah. We did those. Yeah, we did. What kind of material were you guys doing? Oh, this was back. You know, I sang a lot of Pat, Pat Benatar and Blondie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm looking at the date, 79 to 81. You know, you got two singers up there. And I mixed a band for many years. Well, not many years, but for a while. That was a that was a did band that did clubs, weddings and, and bar mitzvahs and crazy rich people parties. Yeah, yeah, a Mo, yeah, yeah. Motown band where they had a male and a female singer. So they, they covered they covered everything. Yeah. So it's, and 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 I now that I'm thinking about it, I think it was a five piece <laughs> or a six piece band, but they had a horn section, Motown. But um, you know, so I, I dig the vibe. Now, how were you guys traveling? So we had like a a small van with all of our equipment in it. Yeah, and then uh, then one of the other guys would take a car as one of his cars. So we just, yeah, like caravaned it. Yeah, caravaned it. <laughs> but like, we had our own, like, you know, lights and all that stuff, so. Oh, you had to. Yeah. Because you showed up the club, there was nothing there. That's right. Nothing yeah. there but an uneven stage with some nails sticking out of it. Or if the stage at all, you know how that goes. <laughs> oh, yeah, just some dark, dank corner with some outlets the on the wall. <laughs> yeah <laughs> where you know where they put the stage wherever nobody wants to sit <laughs> right <laughs> we're never going to sell any seats here <laughs> we're gonna put the stage here <clears throat> yeah yeah i dig it and you know that I, I i the reason i stop you and emphasize these little things right is because when people today uh think about traveling from show to show they think about just you know, just getting their a guitar, putting it in a case and going. I mean, it, it was not that way. You had to bring the show with you. You know, you had to bring it with you. You had to set it up. You had to get everything together. You had to kill all that time during the day before the show. Somebody had to go out and get the rooms, those crappy, shitty Motel 6 rooms, if you could afford it. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm sure that uh, that you and I probably played some of the same clubs on different years. Yeah. Right. Because I was on the East coast um, playing between 85 and 80, uh, 88, okay. uh, you know, between Florida and, um, and you're, and, you're a guitar player. I was, I was a bass player professional. Bass? Okay. Yep. okay. That's cool. Great. Okay. So, so you did look her from 79 to 81. You had three years of that. And you said, listen, this is enough of this shit. <laughs> what made you walk away from that? Um, well, because I, you know, it's just so, it's, it's so rare for anyone to, to, to make it as a vocalist with that's all they do is, is sing. And I just, I, I was scared, you know, single woman, you want to make sure you get, you can pay the bills. And, and, and how old were you? And, and, and how old were you in 1981? So night 19. You're a 19 in 81. Yeah. So you're a 17 in 79. Yes. So, I skipped a year. So I, I graduated in 1978, skipped my, uh, you know, graduated early and then went straight into singing with that band and working and trying to go. <laughs> well, you know, listen, it is quite the accomplishment for a 17 year old woman to get out there and step on stage in front of a band. One, two, three. And here we go <laughs> yes. uh, on the downbeat and stand up there and deliver and keep your composure and keep it together and stay in pitch and stay in time and yeah, sing yeah. at the same Aww. speed as everything, you, you know. Yeah, but if you, I mean, if, if you've trained enough and, you know, you don't need to, I mean, if you work hard enough at anything, you're going to, you're going to look like, you, you know. I, I, I agree with you 100% on that. But at, at the same time, I will say this, that one hour on stage is worth 100 hours in the basement. 
you know. That's and, so true. So much can happen. <laughs> you know, you got to be able to wing it when they heckle you. And you got when people even shouting shit out to you, you know, to keep your keep your focus, keep your this, keep your yeah. that. And yeah. you keep your energy up when you're playing to tables and ashtrays and there's nobody out there. And tonight really sucks. But the one night you just phoned it in because tonight really sucks. That was the night the record executive came out and saw you. <laughs> but he was the only one guy in there. <laughs> You know, so you always have to keep the performance level up, no matter who's out there. Yeah. Keep the show the same. So, you know, for being a girl 17, 18, 19 out there, I mean, oh, so sweet. Thank <laughs> I you. give it up to you. I give it up Thank to you. you. It's an epic, epic accomplishment. I, I only know so many uh, women of that era that did step downstage and take the downstage mic and take the center stage and especially in the in the heavier music male dominated music oh, it's, yeah. Oh. yeah women women even now you know we're we don't know anything we don't know what key we're singing our songs and we don't we don't know how to direct a band we don't know how to show yeah. them what tempo it is you know it's yeah. just <sighs> yeah and and that the, the and the thing that that uh, makes me crazy at work is that when I'm dealing with an artist who, you know, has all the money in the world behind them and they, and they are so mentally lazy. I don't, I don't even know what the reason is that they check themselves out from everything around them. Uh, you know, which, um, which I find fascinating, you know, for, you know, for somebody like yourself, like when you were 19, you, you, you would have bit through a steel, steel bolt to get on an MTV stage and deliver a rock solid, uh, heartfelt performance and not just kind of, eh, yeah, going to yeah. End, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what did you, so you left Looker for a lot of reasons. We could all agree on that. And yeah. then what was your next big gig? Um, <clears throat> Oh boy. So as far as singing, um, I just kind of always did it advocationally until I moved back to Augusta and, you know, just kind of wanted to sing around town. I got into like a blues band for a minute and I love jazz, I grew up with jazz. So I was in a jazz band and that's when James Brown heard me. Because he would come into this place and I was singing jazz. What was the place called? And it was uh, it's called the Sheridan. It was the, um, you know, it's like the hotel lobby at the Sheridan in Augusta. <laughs> Listen, that, I, don't, I, I don't know if you know this, but I talk about all the time that some of the best talent in the world is working at, <laughs> as, at the airport hotel. <laughs> and, you know, when I say that, I mean it. I mean right. it. And here you are, proof of it. <laughs> Uh, it, Augusta, though, it has so much talent. I mean, my gosh, any place you walk in, it's going to knock your socks off. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much here. I love it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I was I was singing, and he used to come in all the time. And so one day he came in, and I slipped him my card. And um, he had just gotten out of jail, and he had, was just putting together a band to go back on the road. What year was this? Um. 1993 okay yeah okay so you had a bit of a hiatus but you're but, yeah. but you really brought it back around and may i say this too in 93 you know you're much more mature yeah you know you're much more seasoned now you have a you have a solid decade of live performances behind you well okay not only that but in 1978 uh, I worked in a disco and James Brown and Entourage came into the disco. He had seen me perform uh, in a, a, a Cold Porter review and he saw me. And so he came into the, the, uh, the disco and he was like, you need to sing with me. And he wrote his, his, uh, his manager's name on a napkin. And this was in 1979. And, you know, it's all the disco era. Yeah. And I thought, uh, you know, I actually talked to some people and they said, you know, no, he's, you know, he's, he's playing skating rings, Kelly. No, you don't. Is now not the time to go out with Mr. Brown. So I'm really glad I waited because, like you said, fast forward, I was mature. 
um, I didn't sort of feel like life owed, owed me stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was, but I tell you what, I, I didn't know how green I was um, until I got with that band. You know? Oh, jump into the show machine, right? Wow, the talent and that. And it was like, you know, it's Noah's Ark. So there were two, two guitars, sometimes three, uh, two bass players, a huge horn section. Background singers were six. A percussionist. There, there were two six, drummers at six the Six BGVs. At, at one time, we were six. When I first joined, we were like a choir. Where did you stand in the line? Um, at first, I was in the back because I'm tall. <laughs> but um, but then towards then I kind of. But here's you know whenever and you'll notice if you ever like look at some YouTube videos I used to do this. I would make friends like I would, okay I'm giving my I'm giving myself away. I would make friends with the uh, with the um, the camera guy. I would just like say, I would just like strike up a conversation with him or whatever. Say he would remember me. I would say, you know, say something to him or ask him about something. We laugh and stuff. So then when they would go to shoot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let me tell you, there is no old school lesson more valuable to anyone that ever sees this than that. (laughs) <laughs> that there's nothing more powerful than making friends at the gig with oh the people God. on the crew. Fuck the you producers know, and it's the crew people that will always take care of you. I, that is actually, and, and I probably learned this from being in the theater, but when, I, you know, when you, we would get to, with James Brown, we'd get to the venue at like two in the afternoon. Okay, all the all the loading guys were already there, all union yep. guys, working, working, working so hard, so hard. The only kind of break they took was when we were on stage. The second we did that last, that, 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 and then we were off stage, bam, there was the crew, they're getting everything. <laughs> I mean, and I, so therefore, I would go and I'd always thank them. I mean, that is such a hot, long, and it's tough because you got to be, you have to be aware. It's real physical. You, I mean, there's so much that can go wrong and you yep. could get hurt, you know oh, what yeah. I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, always. It, it's you an guys. active, fluid environment. And, you know, let's face it, I, I don't care how good a band is unless, it, unless you can hear it and you can hear what you're supposed to, what it really sounds like. That's where you come in, you know, so. Oh, yeah. I've actually done monitors for James Brown. Where do you know where that was? It was in it was in Cleveland. Okay. It was at some kind of festival, something, something. You didn't do the rock and roll, Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the, uh, the brand new thing, did you? In 1995? I was yeah. there. Well, we were too. You know, that's yeah. that, the thing with every, every, everybody on the planet that was ever acknowledged by the. <laughs> yeah, I got high with James Brown there. What? I what? smoked, I smoked reefer with James Brown, <laughs> Clarence Clemens, and Greg Allman. That Cle- is so funny. <laughs> I know James Brown loved weed, man. He, I wish he would just would have stuck with the weed. He would have been so much better off. Yeah, well, it was at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium, 1995. The pass is on the wall behind me. I'm Dude. walk. I'm walking back in, and some Southern guy said, "Hey, you, bro, you got a light?" And I walk over, and it's Greg Allman that's asking me for a light, and he's standing with Clarence Clemens and James Brown, and I and I hand him the lighter. You know, and instead of handing me back the lighter, he lights it and hands me the joint. So now I take a hit off it and I hand it to Clarence and Clarence hands it to James Brown. And I'm just standing in this fucking circle with these guys. You know, I'm just a stagehand <laughs> walking through there. And as we were standing there, Johnny Cash walked by and said, you boys need to stay off the reefer. Like it was the most surreal <laughs> it's the most surreal moment that you know you'd never think a kid from Cleveland would uh, encounter these four icons yeah. within the same perimeter and I'm getting yeah. high with James Brown these guys are riffing on each other and true story I have no idea what James said 
<laughs> the entire time, you know, well, and I was for, you for acknowledging that because yeah. I, I would see people who would actually try to answer them back. And I'm like, dude, you don't know anything that he said. Don't know what the fuck he said. <laughs> and, and, and at the time uh, I was starstruck. It, admittedly, one of the few times in my life that I was like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> that's great though. Yeah. But yes, yeah. I was there. So you were there for that. Yeah, I was there for that. Okay. We got to back up real, real, real quick. We got to back up. So, ninety three, you you hook up with James Brown. The, with, you get hired. When is the first time that you put your feet on the bus? Oh God! <laughs> I have an issue with that bus. No, um, <laughs> uh, immediately. Actually, um, he hired me. I uh, went into rehearsals with Martha High, just learning the dance steps and with just her, my vocal part, which I'm an alto. So it's just kind of like, there's the root, I'm right under it. So it's easy, but yeah. like learning the words and all that stuff. So about a week. Awesome. Awesome. And so you got on the bus physically in Augusta. Yeah. Because, you know, as you know, Augusta is a place where they store and keep a lot of tour buses. The Talmadge Lewis? Is that why? I mean, is that, that's who we use. What, the, what do you mean? Not Provos, not the good ones. Well, meaning that, um, you know, around the country, there's only so many places that they store and keep tour buses. You know, uh, California, California. Uh, Arizona, and then the next big jump is Texas, and then Georgia and Florida. No one's keeping tour buses in Michigan. No one's keeping them in New York. They don't store them in Indiana. <laughs> you know, they don't keep them anywhere in the rot zone. <laughs> They're all down south. You need a tour bus and you're up in New York, you call a uh, Florida coach and the thing's on its way. And uh, in Augusta, my memory of Augusta is there was a several uh, tour bus companies and also companies that uh, uh, refer, rebuilt, refer, uh, refer, refabricate, refabricate. So there's a word I'm looking for. Refurbished, you dumbass. Yeah. They rebuild them, they do them, they sell them, they make them, they push them out there. So for you guys to leave out of Augusta, I, uh, 100%. And where was the first show on that first tour? In Canada. But so you know this, so you, I, I have to go back to this tour bus situation because James Brown was known for having like the worst. I mean, oh my God, you know, it was not. We called them the hoopties. It, was, <laughs> like, it wasn't glamorous and nice. I mean, we had, it was a converted trailways bus <laughs> with all the singers, all the dancers, all the, all the musicians. We had like 27 people. So in other words, you didn't even have like a little bitch to yourself someone was sitting in the seat next to you yeah pakistani style you're the only thing <laughs> missing is a couple chickens and a, a goat on the roof <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you would have to take the bus from augusta and then you go to atlanta and pick up everybody in atlanta and then drive all the way to la yeah so i know i would not do that <laughs> i would find out when the bus was supposed to arrive in la and i'd book my own flight I'm yeah. not going to take three days out of my life to get on a, a bus <laughs> that is all converted trailway. <laughs> that everybody thought I was a brat. Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> for, for a couple of things. First off, good for you for taking a stand. Good. Uh, congratulations to you for having the resources to even be able to do that. You know, I mean, God knows. I couldn't afford a flight. <laughs> yeah, the I was a massage therapist when I when I came back. So I would do uh, uh, when I wasn't on the road touring. I I'd, I'd work on clients. I was always busy. <laughs> yeah, that that is a horrible way to um, cattle people around. <laughs> you know. So yeah, yeah. So, so the first your first show you did yeah. go from Augusta to Canada. Yeah, I went up to Canada. I mean, and also sort of like. Right away was this long tour all the way through like, oh gosh, Finland and Norway and all these, you know, Nordic 
places and I, you know, we were eating reindeer and stuff. I mean, it was just crazy. And I, uh, so that was kind of right off the bat. So how many people total would you guess you were traveling with? You had 27. You had 27. Mm-hmm. And that's not his, now he was, he did not travel with us, obviously. Of course. Yeah. And then he had his own entourage. So there were about 10, anywhere from five to 10 people with him all the time. Uh, that's actually um, not so bad compared to today's numbers. <laughs> oh, he was old school. He was really, yeah. really old school. We rehearsed all the time. When you were on his watch, you were not allowed to go and do other things. That Towards the end, he loosened up a, a lot. But in yeah. the early 90s, he had just come out of jail. It was like, I mean, he was so... Keep it tight. Yeah. Keep it tight. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was a guy that had uh, an amazing career, a lot of longevity, a lot of rides up and down. Uh, when did Living in America come out? God, that was the Rocky, I guess the mm-hmm. early 70s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Living oh. in America. That had to be 80s, I'm going to say. Uh huh. Yeah. Living it because that was a real spin around moment for him. Yeah. You know, here's the thing, Peter. He could have done so much more, but because he had to do it his way, regardless of, you know, any of the new innovations that, that he could have used. Um, but, it, you know, he, he didn't want anybody pr- to produce him. Rick Rubin wanted to produce him. Oh, my God. Um, oh, God. You know, there's just so many really cool, uh, uh, you know, what do you call that when you work with other people? Collaborations. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And he just, unless he was running the show 100%, he just didn't want to do it. So, you know, I, I give it up to him for that. You know, because there was a lot of artists from his uh, time you know, and especially that time and that genre that he came from, where most of those people did not own any of it. Yeah. You know, most of those musicians, those singers, the, even the songwriters didn't own it. They, they didn't have huh. a say-so. Who was it? Alan Walden owns all of the Leonard Skinner catalog stuff. So, I mean, you know, there are a lot of people that, in, in even before, you know, yeah. in James Brown's era, because they weren't as savvy. But then the, you get to people now that just, uh, you know, how they can be taken advantage of. And it's, it's uh, I think a lot of people are too embarrassed to tell, to say that they've been taken advantage of. But yeah, you're, you're right. James Brown, he would pick people to be around him that he knew would rip them off so that he could rip them off. And it was this little game that they all played. <laughs> hey, you know, like, give me the devil I know. Exactly. You know, it, it, at least, exactly. if you, at least if you're screwing me, look me in the eye when you're doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you let's know, not like do that, it behind the bed. What, like, wasn't all the outlaw guys? Um, who was it that was with Waylon Jennings? I mean, um, oh shoot, Willie Nelson, uh, who would always, um, you know, take care of uh, Paul English. You know, who would always, you know, kind of take make sure that. You know, I mean, guns were involved when people needed to get their money, and so James Brown was kind of oh. You know, he oh, would not yeah. in my lifetime. <laughs> See? So, you know. Yeah. Don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I I've been at gunpoint at the gig. I, I know all about it. <laughs> you know, and people yeah. can't even believe it, but uh, it, it it is just as rootin' tootin' wild west as it was in in what they call the B markets. You know, and you talk about the funnel cake tour and this county fair and that festival and the sheriff's brothers putting on this thing. And, you know, you know, I mean, I had it happen to me in Augusta, Georgia. I was a tour manager for a band and they didn't have the money and I had the contract and and they were a bunch of hippies. And I was kind of clean cut looking. Well, whatever. Uh, I'm definitely not some hippie, right? (laughs) And I went and I got the sheriff and I took the sheriff to the box office and I took all the money out of the box office. I completely cleaned them out. I went to the merch table. I took all their money because I had the contract that they owed me the X amount of dollars. I had the sheriff with me, (laughs) you know, and, but I got, I got the bulk of the money, (laughs) you know, and that's what it's all about. 
getting the money. At the end of the day, it's a business. You're not showing up there to make friends. You're showing up there to get the money. And James Brown, I guarantee, had instances in his life where he did not get the money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. So <laughs> well, 93, well, anyway. 93, it all takes off for you. Yeah. How long of a ride do you uh, run that with? Run with it. How long of a ride do you have with them? I, I until 2005. Holy shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it was so funny because I didn't, I never considered myself as someone who would be able to be so flexible, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, with a drop of a hat. Hey, we got to go here. Uh, they just want you on this show and they do, did you? And, you know, you got to your family has to understand or be mad at you because yeah. this is your job and you have to go. And, um, you know, and, and also uh, uh, the rejection and, you know, he was uh, he, all that stuff that you heard about him being hard on people and cruel and mean and all that stuff. It's true. It's really, really true. So uh, for me, I had to get to a point where if he said I was amazing or if he said I was the worst it had to mean exactly the same thing to me. You know, I knew I, you know, I, I knew what I was capable of and I knew what I could do. And I was really, really uh, anchored in that. I, I, I'm real secure in, in that. But uh, at first, you know, you just want to break, you know, so yeah, I learned yeah. a lot. A absolutely. And, and the, the number one lesson here is that when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with celebrities, and you're dealing with somebody that has come to a point in their career like a James Brown, right? This is somebody who, that does not have your perspective. <laughs> he has his perspective, which is the center of his universe is like, why is everyone else not as good as me? Why is everyone else not understanding what I'm saying? Why are you not getting, if I can do it, why are you not doing it? You know, that's his, that's his truth. And even though he comes off as snappy and shitty and mean and cruel, which is all true, which is all true. I find that from their perspective, they're frustrated with not uh, being able to implement their vision. Yeah. Sometimes it's not because they're not explaining it correctly. Right. And sometimes it's just because X, Y, and Z. <laughs> it's just like you had a great run there. Can you tell me your favorite roadie story from your time with James Brown? Um, geez. you would ask me that. Uh, Did you ever get mad at the monitor guy? Did you ever get up there and your <laughs> mic was feeding back? Did you ever get up there and your mic wasn't working? Yeah, well, I kind of got my ear blown out at Glastonbury. You know, that real big Glastonbury festival? Oh, yeah. And those giant speakers on the stage. See, we didn't ever have monitors for the singers. He wanted people to be able to see our dance steps. So our monitors were behind us. <laughs> you so got to see the shoes. <laughs> you got to see the steps. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, <laughs> so I didn't, uh, you know, you kind of learn how to just sort of hear without, having a monitor just hear what the you know speakers but anyway yeah that was bad but I, I, see I don't I'm I'm like super pro roadie guys that I like I said we couldn't do what we do without you guys first setting it up pro preliminarily and then putting it up real nice so that we can be used again so you know I don't, yeah. it in. yep putting it up checking it out getting the talent up there doing the show tearing it down yeah. What are we doing for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and two, uh, I, I think that uh, one thing that most people don't realize about the business is the, just the mundane boredom of all the in-between. You know, it's the in between. Hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait, man. I mean, that two hours that you're on stage every night, that's great. But the other 22 hours, 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's a drag. And the fact that you miss everything at home, you miss every birthday, you miss every holiday, your birthday, you're in a truck, you're in a plane, you're in a somewhere, you yeah. know, um, you get a cupcake for your birthday cake. Yeah, you gotta really <laughs> love this. You gotta really, really yeah. love this. You know, yeah. I didn't know that I did. You know, I had, I had totally quit singing completely. Um, uh, but I took voice lessons just because I wanted to uh, talk to this woman who was an amazing voice teacher. Mm -hmm. ended, I ended up studying her, with her for two years. So I'm singing again. So, nice. and yeah, I'm 61 years old. So it's real, uh, it's, it, I didn't really sing for like five years. Like it was real, it just didn't, I didn't have the range or the stamina or anything. So it's real fun to be, to be singing again. I sing, I'm with Greg Hester now. That's who I sing with now. Greg Hester. Well, let me tell you something. I am one year behind you and I'm putting a band together this year. So, <laughs> you know, oh my I, God. I, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's I, so I, worth it. I'm still, I, I played four hours last night until four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still playing. I'm still interested. I'm putting a show together. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm all about it. You know, so many years that I didn't play because I was too busy having a life yeah. and too busy uh, being ambitious and going from thing to thing, to thing, to thing, to thing, where there's no, I mean, I have instruments that sat for 20 years that picked up, <laughs> you know, yeah. but life yeah. gets busy as you know. I do. As I know. you know. So tell me, uh, tell us, tell everyone, what are you working on right now? So I'm with Greg Hester. If you YouTube Greg, you'll see he's got like 12 or 13 uh, albums out. Well, we'll he's put a link. On a project. Yeah. What? Yeah. We'll put the link absolutely below. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. He's so good. Um, actually, he's the producer that got the James Brown band together right when Mr. Brown died and went through all the great songs and then put the album out. He was going to sing all the lead, but then ended up getting a bunch of really, really cool people to to like sing the lead part. And then, in other words, John Popper sings some mm -hmm. stuff on there. So like all these really great. I can't off the top of my head. But anyway. So he, when he put that together, I sang background for him. And so that's how I met Greg. We became friends that way, stayed in touch. And then a couple of years ago, um, kind of got back together as far as friends. And now we're singing. The, actually, he's my boyfriend now. Oh. <laughs> it's so great. But we, it is so fun. He's got such a great voice. And he's working with Becca Bramlett. And I don't know if you ever remember... Um, Delaney and, and and Bonnie and friends. So they were in the 70s, remember, Matt? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, Joe Cocker and all that stuff. Well, their daughter together is bon is uh, Becca Bramlett. Oh, she is so, so good. So they're, they're working on a project together, and um, that should be released soon. So I want to tour and all that stuff. I'm so ready. <laughs> Well, you know, I do one tour a year and it's three weeks and that's my maximum time away. From Where do home. you go? Uh, I do the same 10 cities every year. Uh, if I can remember, Dallas, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, Boston, Philly, D.C., Atlanta and Miami. <laughs> wow. OK. OK, so I'll have to catch you in Atlanta. Yeah, it's the Jingle Ball Tour. It's America's favorite pop show. And we do it every December for okay. the first three weeks of December. I love and, that. Yeah, I'm totally it, serious. I'm going to come in and, uh, you know, backstage passes and front row seats. You know how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was great. Uh, last year in Atlanta, I hooked up with a buddy of mine uh, that I haven't seen in 30 years. You know, and it was just amazing to see him and meet his family, you know, and look into the eyes of this man that I spent so much time with in the 80s, you know, and, and that's, uh, it, it's always great catching up with old friends because there's no friends like old friends. Right, that is, yeah. No friends like old friends. And, and, and for me, and I'm sure for you too, that we have too many friends that are no longer with us. You know, and so every day is just a blessing. 
<laughs> you know, every day is a good one. And the fact that you and me and others like us that are at our age are still healthy. I mean, I tell people that when I was a kid, people that were 60 years old were in a wheelchair and people were putting blankets over them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know they weren't they were knitting. <laughs> yeah they were knitting they weren't loading in central park i believe it <laughs> right see i'm i'm like making up line dancing stuff using some old songs from james brown i mean i'm yeah. like I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah that's fantastic well yeah. listen i i really appreciate you taking the time and telling me your story i mean it was just really really inspiring you know you you started off as just a as a kid with a dream you know, you went on the road as a teenager and you did the nightclubs and you paid the dues every step of the way. You had an epic run with the Godfather of Soul and you never had to go on a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and and now and now you're 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 sleeping with the talent and that's okay. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> yeah, it all comes full circle. <laughs> hey, it was great talking to you today. Peter, you too. Thank you so much. I had a great time. You thanks. know, thanks for taking the time and, and sharing your story. And if anything else pops up in the future that you want to talk about, you know, hey, let's let's do it and let's talk concerts, you know, because this is uh I just love doing this. Me too. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Because uh certainly what you've done in the past was exciting. And I'm confident just talking to you that anything you do in the future is gonna be you. just as good. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Best to you. Thanks again Thank for you. coming on. Kelly Jarrell, have a great day. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.